You're watching the Randy Alvarez Marketing Report. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, uh, guided surgery with oral and maxillofacial surgeon, Dr. Picos. Dr. Picos, welcome to the program. Thank you, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, everybody knows who you are, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you know, no matter who I talk to, even the mini implant guys, they know <laughs> Picos is coming on your show. Why is Picos <laughs> doing it, right? But uh, I want to, you know, have you on this report because I know that dentists, about you know, 30 or you know, 40 or so, fly out to your center. For people that don't know about your institute or have questions or want to know more, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the training programs that are available and why guided. And I'll let you take over. Well, in a nutshell, Randy, I've um, been fortunate and blessed to have an institute for 25 years uh, now. And I've been able to train uh, more than 3,000 uh, individuals, clinicians from all 50 states and uh, 32 countries. And it's really been a lot of fun to interface with these individuals over the years. Um, and what's given me the best um, feedback, the best, uh, what's the word, gratification, if you will, is knowing that these individuals can go back to their practices and do what I'm showing them, depending on their background, certainly. Is this an um, advanced group of guys? That means they've already been doing implants for quite yes. some time, placing and restoring yes, implants? Yes, for the most part, yes, because okay. the courses I've taught traditionally have been basically bone grafting courses at three different levels and a soft tissue grafting course, and more recently, in the last two years, a, um, a guided full arch uh, immediate uh, reconstruction course, which has been extremely popular because... We're the only show in town, so to speak. There's no one teaching this particular uh, end sequence prosthetic protocol that really has been a, a phenomenal advantage for our patients. And I say that because unlike the traditional, you know, all on four approach, which uh, most You're clinicians You're not a fan do, of the all on four well, standard approach, right? Let me say this. It, it's it's a certainly a, a tra the traditional way of, of, of addressing uh, our edentulous population and our terminal dentate population, absolutely. Nothing wrong with it except that there are at least five, six advantages of, of the guided full arch uh, immediate reconstruction approach. And in fact, let me, let me share those with yeah. you. Uh, first things first, from just a diagnostic uh, workup perspective, uh, this is a, a way better approach in terms of, of accuracy because we're using third-party software that is such, um, uh, let's put it this way, we're able to use a software with all the diagnostic criteria that we have conventional at our fingertips, photos, etc. But get this, the STL files of our photos are fused with the DICOM files of our cone beam CT. And that's done at the lab in Reno, Nevada, and uh, Daniel Lopp being the inventor of this technology really has done an outstanding job because with this fusion, if you will, of, of STL and DICOM files, we now have the ability online to have a true collaboration between myself, a restorative dentist, and the lab. And when I say collaboration, I mean that because we're all involved with the planning, meaning where, number one, where are the teeth going to be ultimately? And what do they look like? They're not just a generic set of teeth, absolutely not. They're characterized, they're positioned, they're formed, et cetera, to be custom to the patient, number one. Number two, inevitably, most of our patients have to have, to have some bone removed, believe it or not. So it, it's in reverse to what I've been preaching for 25 years, all my grafting courses, et cetera. But for these patients, it's a different ball game. So yes, some bone has to be removed. Well, in the conversion protocol, and I've done uh, conversion, and I still do some, yes. Uh, in this protocol, it's free-handed, meaning um, we're eyeballing with a prosthesis that's made in advance, kind of a pseudo-guide. Maybe a few dots are made in the bone, and then everything's connected, et cetera. Well, there can be a cant, left, right, front, back. It's, guess what? With the pre-planned approach, we use what's called a bone foundation guide that's placed into the mouth. After the gum, the flaps have been reflected, teeth have been removed, this foundation guide goes in and it is indexed to the opposing arch all the time. And when, in order, in, so in doing that, we don't have a cant left, right, front, or back. It's right on the button. So once we've done that, we fixate that particular foundation guide, open up, take out the index, and now I can teach an eight year old to Jimmy, just take the bone, you know, take this little drill and reduce the bone to the level of plastic. Now the beauty of this protocol is the next prosthesis, or I should say the next guide that goes in, 
is our surgical guide. Well, traditionally in guided surgery, the foundation guide would be removed and then goes the surgical guide. Well, there's room for error. So this protocol is so much better because we put the foundation guide, it stays in. It's called a foundation guide for that reason because it's a true foundation, unlike a bone um, uh, reduction guide that's been around forever. All right. So picture in your mind's eye, the surgical guide gets indexed, pinned into the foundation guide. It's also indexed posing arch to make sure it's accurately placed, right? So now through these prefabricated holes in the guide, we already know the implant length, diameter, and angulation. Isn't that great? They, so it's guided surgery through the sleeves. Then the surgical guide is removed with the mounts from the implants. And now what's done is a bone reduction around the implant bodies as we would with our conversion protocol. We then put in our multi-unit abutments, which by the way are already determined in advance, cuff heights, etc. So all this is streamlined. It's like checklist manifesto. Step one, two, three, four, it's orchestrated. So the day of the surgery, it's very easy on you. Zero, minimal stress, minimal stress, because the abutments go in, the copings, which are already pre-cut, et cetera, so they go in, it's, it's so efficient, so fast, and then picture now, we put in a gasket that blocks out how we pick up our, our hybrid prosthesis. It, by the way, is prefabricated. It's a bar-supported, PMMA monolithic. So it's strong. It's very strong. So we're not going to have teeth chipping off, the prosthesis fracturing, none of that. You that's don't like the on. plastic. I do not. That's being, I do the, not. you know, the conversion. No, is that what it's called? The, the conversion protocol. Because you don't like my restorative all. colleague is stuck with what? The maintenance issues. The surgeons were not like jackrabbits. No big deal. But, or it is a big deal if it's under your own roof. Now you appreciate what's going on. So all this is done. It's picked up with a flowable composite unscrew, take it out. Now we call it a refinement. It takes my restorative quality 15 minutes on average to refine the prosthesis. Forget the conversion. We don't need a laboratory uh, at all. In fact, our lab is almost the size of a phone booth. It's so small. It's a wet <laughs> lab. I mean, really, you know, no boiler plates and all this other nonsense and taking an hour and a half to convert the denture. Are you kidding? No, 15, 20 minutes. In fact, there's a race for me to suture and close while my restorative colleague is refining the prosthesis. So then we come, the prosthesis comes back now. We take out our healing abutments, in goes, we screw it in, et cetera, check the bite. We can do two arches in four hours on average, sometimes less, just depending on the specifics of the case. What about cost for, for the dentist? The cost for the dentist will vary. As compared from, to the other way. You know, it, well, believe it or not, Randy, the cost is very comparable. In fact, it's so close that um, I would say it's almost the same. The reason being the laboratory component that's involved with the conversion will typically uh, be about a thousand dollars additional. Uh, so it's over, about a thousand more to do it this way. So right, plus or minus, we but might it saves you time oh, as a dentist. Absolutely. In fact, the you're time, two hours less with the patient. The, the time is so different, and and everybody is de-stressed. Our staff. The docs, our anesthesia individual, which typically would be my wife, who's an anesthetist. But okay. uh, bottom line is, it just de-stresses everybody. It's such a nice protocol, so so predictable, and most importantly, here's how I see it: my patient's paying me for, let's face it, a high-end prosthesis, right? When all is said and done, even er early on, like fact, a Mercedes. Let's, let's back up. Yes, let's, that's a great analogy. Let's say you're paying me for. <clears throat> Even for the provisional, that should be, I'll call it a C-class Mercedes. Why not? Because guess what? They're going to market for me, for my practice, for all of us. And during those four months, do you want that person out there with chipped teeth, breaking, they're back and forth, they're not happy? Those are the four best months of marketing you can ever want. So the way I see it with this end sequence protocol, this same day teeth approach that we use, we're giving them a C-class Mercedes. And guess what? In four months, they're going to upgrade to a an S-Class Mercedes. Instead of the conversion protocol, I, from an analogy standpoint, I'll call that a 2006 Chevy with 100,000 <laughs> miles on it, and it's breaking down you know, more times than you care to think about it. So there's a huge difference. So comparing, in summary, the two protocols. So you, you know, don't like that other, that other way. In fact, you told me this on the phone. It's like you're, you, you bought a Ferrari, it's on order, you get it in two months, and, and, and while you're waiting, they give you some... Yeah, the, the loaner is, is something. The loaner car is just yeah, terrible. It's, just not, not, it's not indicative of what you and your practice is all about. You're, you're, giving a, 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 you're sending a mixed message, and the technology is so crude compared to what we can do today. 
I mean, day and night. How long, okay, so at your course, they, they, they fly to your center. If somebody's pretty good, they've been placing or restoring implants or placing implants for many years. How hard is it to learn this protocol to implement in their practice? Depending again on the experience level of the clinician, what we encourage strongly is this, this approach is really for the surgeon or, and or periodontist that can come ideally with their one or two top restorative dentists as a team. Because we have found now over the past two years of our courses that those folks that come that way, meaning as a team, they're the ones that go back, because we're tracking everybody. They go back and immediately incorporate the protocol. Because what they see during the three days is as I see it, and it's true for all of the courses that I've taught over all these years, I, I like to look at different facets of the educational component or process, meaning number one, there's a didactic element, sure, great three, three to one PowerPoint presentations, great video, high definition, they will see live surgery, and guess what else, hands-on, which is killer for this particular course because the hands-on protocol is exactly what's done in the mouth. So in essence, as I see it, it's a trifecta approach more or less. You get everything from hands-on to live surgery to viewing it and now go back and do it. But if you have your team with you, see, then it's so easy because if a surgeon comes or a periodontist only and they go back and try to explain to the restorative so person. So bring the team. Bring the Who team. Who do you want them to bring? Bring the team. Their top one, two, uh, one, one uh, surgeon from Texas brought four of his top people and he's off and running. He did seven, eight arches in a matter of a few months. I mean, unbelievable what can be done now. So yes, in a nutshell, the course is very comprehensive and will play off the experience level of the clinician. If, you've already, if you're already doing all on fours, it's a no brainer because in fact, part of my whole approach to this, and I make this a big point during the course, and that is that you really need to know how to do conversion protocols if you're gonna do full arch guided. Why? Think about it. The same principles are involved to a point, meaning that the workup is the same in terms of some diagnostics, but more impressively, when you go on the virtual, in this virtual world it, with the software to plan teeth, implants, et cetera, it's all based on the same concepts and principles, meaning where are these implants going? They have to engage basal or bone. They can't be placed conventionally. Well, we know that from our conversion protocol um, training. So that's important. And guess what? In day one of our courses, I literally review the entire conversion protocol from A to Z purposely. Why? Two reasons. One, I need to get people up to snuff if they're not too familiar with okay. it. But two, we end the first day with a sneak preview of what's going to happen on days two and three, which is a total immersion of full arch guided via this end sequence protocol, prosthetic protocol. And we get into it heavy duty. And now one can appreciate here and here. And once you've come here, you're not going back. You're just not. Is that right? So these people that converted, they say, you know, I can't go back. No. No matter no, what. Absolutely they not. They love it. No, absolutely not. What do they like most about it, by the way? Of the, the protocol itself? Yeah. Simplicity, once it's understood, there's a learning curve. I will caution everyone and tell them it's going to take a good six, seven, eight, even ten arches to get comfortable with your staff so that everything flows. But once you have that down, the light bulb, you know, is on, that, that, Aha moment hits, wow. and guess what? You're flowing, you'll never look back. It's so neat because we can do a flapless case, my goodness, it's embarrassing how much, <laughs> how little time a two arch flapless could be done in an hour and a half, just like that. Uh, and a full, you know, a terminal dentition, upper, lower, on average is four hours. That could be plus minus depending on the complexity of the case, but we're not having folks pack their lunches from 7 a.m to 5 p.m. like the traditional conversion protocol to arch because the lab component is so uh, time dependent, so labor intensive, those days are gone. We refine the prosthesis. So it's a completely different way of looking at things. Good. I want to thank you for coming on this uh, marketing report, but I also want to do, you know, I always wanted to be like have an Oprah Winfrey kind of a show where I could actually ask personal questions. So let's talk a little bit about you for just a moment. So I know you have two children, adult children, that are uh, going to be dentists. And also I want to know, what do you do for uh, fun, like hobbies, on your off time? Well, let me tell you about the kids. I, I'm proud of both of them. I did not, honestly, a little bit of a guilt trip, I did not encourage them 
um, uh, to even think about dentistry. I didn't want to lay a guilt trip on them, I felt, Randy, because so many uh, parents will try and impose what they're doing on their children. And I, don't th I never thought that was a good thing to do. So I kind of went the other way. And in fact, our daughter wanted to be a vet from a little girl, had dogs, cats, a horse, the whole bit, cleaned up after them, was very focused. We only went to schools that, uh, to interview that had vet programs. Well, long story short, she goes to the University of Florida for pre-vet, and within a few months, I get the phone call, or my wife does it at least, and it's, uh, by the way, it's you know, your daughter. When it's my daughter, she'll be <laughs> money. Uh, your daughter uh, declared a, a biology, of course a biology major. Why not? Pre-vet? No, no, no. She's pre-dent. Pre-dent? Get on the phone. Lindsay, what's going on? Well, Dad, I met this girl from Miami, and she took me to this ASDA program, and I thought it was really cool, and now I'm volunteering at the dental school for three, four hours on Wednesday afternoons. The rest is history. Like, my little girl is going into dentistry. Well, fast forward, she's a graduate of Chapel Hill uh, Dental School, and she's in her second year back at UF in Perio. And in a year and a half plus, she'll be finishing and, and joining Dad in practice. And I'm really excited about that, as she is too. And your son also? Our son, uh, Tony, is 25 years of age. He's at um, MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina, in his third year of dental school. And he's now uh, looking at surgery, perio, some specialty, one of the two, and um, wanting also to, to join dad. So that'll be a little bit longer in time. But they both want to come back to the area uh, and, and be with me. So I'm super excited about that. That's good. Uh, yes. What do you do for fun, by the way? For fun, I, um, I enjoy um, exercising. I enjoy reading. I enjoy, most importantly, being with my family. And my wife, uh, with the kids being out of the fold now for for so uh, for quite a few years, we're able to spend more time together, and, and I thoroughly enjoy that. I'm fortunate to still have my mother alive. My dad passed away last uh, March at 92, World War II vet. We're very close, being an ethnic family, Greek ancestry, very warm, very close. Um, miss him a lot, but mom's still with us at age 85, and um, I enjoy having her with us uh, as well. There seems to be a shift in dentistry, and, and I'd like a final message on this. Uh, because you're, an, I mean, you've been pioneered a lot of these procedures, but, you know, we talked in my green room about how a lot of oral surgeons haven't had to really meet with patients a lot or talk with patients a lot. But now there's a shift happening to where, you know, everybody's learning to place and restore implants. Not everybody, but they're learning to place and restore implants. It's become more competitive where oral surgeons now have to get to know their patients. So, and you're very good, I mean, with... with so what, what advice do you give other oral surgeons on, 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 get, on, on an emphasis on more rapport with the patient or talking with patients? Can you teach that? And I think, do you think that's needed now in this new economy, in this new Google economy, in a competitive economy? I think that's, that's a great question, uh, Randy. I think that, yes, I think it can be taught to a degree. I believe it plays off of one's personality type, for, for, to be quite uh, blunt about it. But that said, it's a teachable skill set. It definitely is. And it's very important that we, as surgeons, be able to communicate quite well, quite effectively with our patients, more than ever, because of what you said. The competitive element, it's there, and it's only going to get more competitive with regard to everybody wanting to do implants from you know, restorative-based yeah. individuals on down the line. So I think it's critical that we as surgeons have the rapport, the communication element uh, way better, not just for ourselves, but our entire staff. I think training, scripting from front desk to assistants, uh, et cetera, that should all be mandatory. It, we cannot take for granted anymore okay. someone just calling randomly on the phone and God only knows how that, an that phone's gonna be answered, et cetera, et cetera. Those days are gone. Now. I've interviewed periodontists and oral surgeons, and oftentimes their excuse, because they don't know stories, they don't know transformation stories. Like the guy that, you know, I mean, you told story after story after story of people that cried, they looked at the mirror, but most of the oral surgeons are not part of that. They're not seeing that mirror part. Or they're just, you know, they're somewhere, and the restorative guy's there. So how did you collect all these stories? And what's your advice to these oral surgeons? Because... They don't have stories. I mean, I meet them and, they're, and they don't have the stories. They don't, they don't know about the restore. They don't know how it's changed the patient's life. Well, you know, Randy, for me, it, it's a bit, I've had a bit of an edge, um, in fact, a, a big edge as I see it, for two reasons. One, 
Um, again, playing on background, being an ethnic background, Greek ancestry, raised very warm environment, lived with my grandparents for the first 10 years of my life, only moved two blocks away. So we were very close. In fact, I only spoke Greek for five years. I went to kindergarten and had to learn English, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the warmth of, a, of an ethnic background, be it whatever, Italian, Bulgarian, Jewish, whatever, that helps because of the warmthness. And for me, it's, it's always been natural to handshake a male patient, embrace a female patient, not a big deal, and, and, and connect. I, I can, it's always been easy for me to, to connect with my but patients. But after the fact, I mean, it's all done, and most oral surgeons, periodontists, are not there for the restorative part. How have you been able to be there? Is it because it's being done there? You bring them in? Well, no, I'm sorry. Then, yes, in that respect, it's, it's, uh, it's all done within my office. That is correct. And so you ask the patient questions? Yes, yes. Like, how's it going? Yes, oh, How sure. does it change your life? No, absolutely. Uh, we're very interactive with our patients throughout the entire protocol. I'll see them early on for uh, at least two visits, and my restorative colleague will see them uh, once, uh, twice on average before the same day teeth protocol. So that day, of course, um, as we've explained, it's all done uh, with screw retained uh, teeth, prefabricated, et cetera. But leading up to it, the rapport has to be there. That's why the approach, I really have an issue with the surgeon meeting the patient for the first time the day of surgery, and that's being done all over the country. It's mm -hmm. not a good thing. I think from a liability perspective, it's, it's a bad thing. And secondly, I would be very uncomfortable saying, hi, Mrs. Jones, I'm Dr. Picos. I'm your surgeon this morning. Uh, let's review your medical history. And there's a diabetic issue, there's this, there's that. I mean, really? Uh, I just have a major league problem with that approach. So, and most of us don't do it so that way. So at least way. meet them at least one time before at the surgery once, on a separate day. At least once, if not twice, because it's important, again, to, to establish rapport and, and a comfort zone for them and for you. We're not streamlining people through. We're not a factory. We're customizing treatment to our patient. So it's going to take some time. But guess what? You're going to save time the day of surgery as well with this protocol. So, you know, does it really matter in the end? I think it, it matters in that we have to treat individuals with respect and dignity always. should go without saying. And I'm not trying to sound I'm, you know, that I'm holier than thou or anything like that. Not at all. It's just that that's, we're a profession for a reason. We have an oath to follow. Otherwise, we're just a trade, and we're certainly not. Especially now, you know, with this change in economy where you have super specialists or general de super general dentists or whatever, they're doing everything, that the oral surgeon has to go out of his way to learn about communication and learn about how to get great rapport and how to create this unique experience when they get there. Because the word of mouth now, that they will, rather than just depending on their referrals from their you know, general dentist, now they'll get more referrals from you know, their... Absolutely, and in fact, on a whole nother note, you know, I see us as becoming the gatekeepers of the entire uh, entity, meaning that you know, we need to be looking at, at marketing direct to the public and hence, you know, that's why you're doing interview. my show. Exactly. Absolutely. This is to me the quintessential, the ultimate way, the pinnacle of, of, as I see it, having reviewed you for so long and been privy to what you've done, to your credit. I mean, you have really created a great niche for the rest of us to be able to utilize your skill sets. I'm a and legend, talents. just like you are. In yes, dentistry. you are. <laughs> yes, you kidding. are. <laughs> no, I'm not a legend. But uh, yeah, that's good. I mean, because the, the idea is going to the public, letting the public know. Because look, who loses if they go to the guy that took the weekend course uh -huh. or the mini implant guy or whatever? Uh -huh. Not only does the doctor lose, the oral surgeon loses, but the patient loses. Absolutely. So I think it's it's almost like a moral obligation nowadays where you have to do a little bit of smart advertising. Yes. Uh, online, digitally, or whatever. Yes. To, yes. Uh, now, there are some restorative-based individuals that with, with great training and, and, and have the skill sets, they can do it all, but that's... That's a handful. And the problem is Joe Public doesn't know yeah. who they are. And you know the story from there. There's problems, there's issues, and then there's lawsuits, et cetera. So the specialist, you know, the surgical trained individual, in our skill sets as oral maxillofacial surgeons with our anesthesia, et cetera, if we, and, and that's at the heart of my courses, become a hybrid surgeon, have, bone and, have equal skill sets in bone and soft tissue, absolutely. And by the way, talking about guided surgery, full arch reconstruction, doesn't mean all the grafting goes out the window. On the contrary. I heard that the periodontists 
on the attend your, your oh, soft absolutely. tissue stuff. For, forever, forever, absolutely. Oh, for soft so you're tissue? Like a, yeah, you're like yes. a periodontist yes, as well. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. Um, so they should learn both. I interrupted everyone, you. Everyone, yes, so everyone should learn both because then you have power, and power means your competition is in the mirror. So you, we need to get better every day with what we do. So you're competing against yourself. So learn the bone, learn the soft tissue. Hence, my soft tissue course is now in its 16th, uh, almost 17th year, because I, I, in the early years, I kept stuffing material into my bone courses and finally said, wait a minute, I have too much stuff. This is crazy. Let me now give birth to another course. And here it is. And it's now been refined and refined, continues to be. I mean, I take 130 hours of CE a year. You do? Or not, for 32 years. I've got over 4,400 hours of CE. So you it. still go all the time? Absolutely. You take just, notes? Just, oh, notes. Do you ever learn new record, things? Record, always. I know that sounds ridiculous always. for me I to just, say that, but. I just spent four days with Otto Zur from Germany, learning um, you know, the micro approach to all this real great soft tissue work in the aesthetic zone. I love doing that. I, I have a passion for everything that I do. I could have retired seven, eight years ago. What would I do? What would I do? I think, I think of that often. Slowing it down is one thing, Randy, but walking away, it's kind of tough to think about yeah. it because I, I, I just enjoy it so much. And I'm still working four days a week at the office uh, when I'm there, and I have my lectures and my course schedule. So, How do they find out more about your course and then we'll, we'll Basically end? online, just Pico's online. Institute. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what's the, are there any, is there any uh, misconception about what you do at your training? I would hope that you'd not. You'd like to clear up? No. I okay. would hope not. Um, you know, let me just say this: the bottom line is for all of my training, all my courses, is that it's indicative of exactly what I do every day in my practice. Good. So I show the good, the bad, the ugly. We show complications all the time. We show everything I'm doing. I won't just wear a Nike cap and knee jerk and show something to my group that I've done once or twice. That doesn't happen. I have to, if it's a graph material, I have to have histology on it and make sure that it's working, etc and on and on. So in essence, it's day-to-day -day work that I do that I share with my, my clinicians. Good. Yes. Well, thank you for coming on the, on the Marketing Report. My pleasure. Report. Thank you. Great show. Thank You've been you. watching uh, the Randy Alvarez Marketing Report. We'll see you next time.